Assalamu alaikum. We'll be talking uh, today about this uh, about visual transduction. Um, basically, it's it's how we see uh, the the molecular mechanism of how we see, and this is to me one of the uh, most beautiful lectures that I've ever prepared and and given. Um, you will see how sophisticated the system is, how beautiful the system is, uh, and how 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 exciting it is. So uh, let's go on. Um, these are the references, of course. The main uh, what you need to know is what I what I'll tell you. But you can go back to these uh, resources uh, to get more information. Uh, I love this second um, uh, reference. <coughs> it's like a, a PDF that contains uh, details of the molecular mechanism of how we see. It's really detailed and and beautiful. Uh, so let's go on. Uh, with the lecture. So, this is what we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about visual transduction, how we see in dark and light. We'll talk about the mechanisms, we'll talk about the cells, and then we'll talk about the molecules. Uh, and then we'll talk about how the signal, not only how it is excited, but also uh, how it's terminated, and that's what's really important as well. Uh, at, the, at the end of this lecture, we'll talk about color blindness and the, the genetics of color blindness. So, let's go on. So basically we see uh, these are the different wavelengths and we see only a very uh, narrow range of wavelengths. Um, these are the colors that we see. Um, okay, let's go on. Um, and the, the cells that help us see, there are two types of cells. We have the rod cells and the cone cells. And, the, and they're given this name because of the way they look like. So these are the rod cells. They are slim and elongated. And these are the cone cells, so they look like cones. Um, there are more rod cells than cone cells. We have 120 million rod cells in our retina. On the other hand, we have 7 million cells of the cone cells. Um, the rod cells are responsible uh, for seeing or vision in the dark. Cone cells are responsible for uh, vision in the light or uh, color vision on the other hand. Uh, these are the cells how they actually look like. These are the rod cells and these are the cone cells. Uh, these cells are connected to different nerves. We'll talk about that uh, briefly as well. All right, so let's talk about rod cells because they are more studied than cone cells. If you look at the cells, we have the cell body right here. That's where the nucleus is, uh, where the cell components are, the mitochondria, the uh, uh, lysosomes, and you know all of the other organelles. Uh, and we have the in the outer segment, we have these cassettes. They look like something like this. They look like CDs. This is where the molecular components are. Um, the molecules that we'll be talking about, the molecules that are responsible for vision. Uh, next, please. So, we'll talk about these. Now, let's talk about the, the dark current. Um, now, you know that neurons are, um, they have a resting uh, potential. Uh, and when they get excited, they get depolarized. Uh, and that's where, the, when the new transmitters are uh, released and the signal starts. On the other hand, um, these rod and cone cells, they, they work the opposite way. They are excited in darkness. They release the, the neurotransmitter in, when, when they are in the dark, when there is no light. And uh, they're already depolarized. On the other hand, and, and the neurotransmitter is basically glutamate. But in the light, what happens is when the signal starts, the, uh, the, the, the channels, instead of being open, they get closed, uh, uh, preventing the ions uh, sodium ions and, and calcium ions from getting into the cells. Um, and as a result, uh, there is decrease in the release of the neurotransmitter. And this is the signal. This is the visual signal on the other hand. Okay, next please. So you can read all the details in these slides. So we'll talk about uh, how the signal is generated when light hits the retina and, and these cells. Next please. So. All right, so these are the components. These are the molecular components of visual transduction. We have this membrane protein, membrane receptor, rhodopsin. We have the transducin, phosphodiesterase, the gated channels, and we have a number, a large number of regulatory proteins, and each one of them has an important role. So let's talk about rhodopsin first. Next, please. Rhodopsin is a seven transmembrane domain protein. So there's uh, seven transmembrane domains. 
uh, it has an, an extracellular uh, domain as well as an intracellular domain as well. This is where uh, where the, the protein interacts. Uh, sorry, that's the extracellular, that's the intracellular. This is the, the part of the protein that interacts with the other components of the cell. Uh, an important molecule that is part of this rhodopsin is the pigment itself, the seven trans uh, element or molecule. So it's basically a protein known as opsin uh, associated with the all trans retinal or the 11 cis retinal. Uh, this is uh, the molecule that absorbs light and initiates the signal. Now, um, what happens is that in the unexcited state, in the cis orientation, so you, you see this double bond in the, uh, carbon number 11, between carbon 11 and 12, it is in the cis orientation. When light hits the molecule, uh, there is excite, excitation of the electrons and a change in the molecular structure of the molecule from the 11 cis retinal, it becomes all trans, so it becomes an, a, a long molecule. So, right, so you have a kink uh, in this double bond. When it gets excited, uh, it becomes straight. Okay. This little change in the structure of this molecule changes the overall structure of the opsin protein or the redopsin protein. Now, the change as well is really, really fast. It's in the femtoseconds, and that was exciting to scientists. This is really quick. Uh, scientists really excited when they learned that. All right. Now, what happens is that this molecule can absorb light in the rod cells. It can absorb light at different wavelengths. Uh, it peaks at about 500 uh, nanometers, but it can also absorb light at different wavelengths as well. And that's what enables us to see in the dark when there is dim light uh, in, in the room. So what happens is that here you have a change from the 11 cis retinal, uh, the protein gets excited and it becomes an all trans molecule. Uh, the, the molecule itself, the protein molecule itself, changes in structures. It goes into different types of structures, little structures that occur. Um, uh, the, the important structure is known as meta-2, meta rhodopsin 2. This is the functional molecule. This is the molecule that transmits the signal. Now, notice that each molecule can absorb light at different wavelengths, and that's what helps us see light you know, in, 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 different, um, in, in different wavelengths. So if you're in the room and you have a dim light, let's say a dim uh, uh, yellow light, you can see as well as you can see in the red light as well. All right, so eventually what happens is that when it undergoes these different transformations or structural transformations, initially what, then what happens eventually is that the molecule itself is released, the old trans retinal is released, and the opsin molecule becomes free, and it can associate with another 11 cis retinal molecule, so it becomes activated again, so it can be, it is ready again to absorb another wavelength of light, another photon. All right, that's the first molecule. The second one is known as transducin. Transducin is a G protein, and this protein is composed of three subunits. We have the alpha, the beta, and the gamma. The alpha subunit is the the active form of the molecule or the active subunit of the molecule, it is bound to GDP. So it is inactivated when it is bound to GDP and it's associated with beta and gamma subunits. What happens when light hits rhodopsin uh, and light is absorbed uh, by, the, by the, old, uh, the 11 cis retinal and it, it converts to the old trans molecule and the molecule becomes activated, the signal is submitted by interacting with the G protein. This results in the release of the GDP, and GTP binds to the alpha subunit. That causes the dissociation of the alpha subunit from the beta and gamma. That allows the alpha subunit to interact with an enzyme known as phosphodiesterase. Phosphodiesterase converts cyclic GMP to GMP. This is important because this channel, the sodium gated channels, are dependent on binding to cyclic GMP. So when phosphodiesterase uh, converts cyclic GMP to GMP, it reduces the amount or the concentration of cyclic GMP in the cell, causing the cells to close and preventing the ions from getting into the cell. 
Now, uh, so this is the activation of the phosphodiesterase. Um, so you have generation of a lot of uh, GMP molecules causing the channels to close. All right, then what happens is that again channels close, uh, sodium ions and, um, and the calcium ions as well do not get into the cell. All right, what happens is that th this is the signal. The signal is transmitted uh, from, uh, from the, um, uh, the retina, from the rod cells, uh, since they're connected to neurons. The signal is transmitted to the brain. And the brain, wh what it does is that uh, depending on where the signal comes from, it forms the image in the proper way. All right, so this is the component again as well. So right here you have the uh, disc right here. Uh, uh, the, the molecular component is on the cell surface. Light hits the um, uh, rhodopsin molecule. It activates the alpha subunit of the G protein, the transducin. It interacts with the phosphodiesterase, causing reduction in the level of cyclic GMP in the cell, causing the channels to close, preventing the sodium ions from getting into the cell. Okay, there is this concept of signal amplification. Um, so one photon may excite uh, one cell, but this one photon is really important, or the signal has to be amplified in order to see in dim light. So how, how is the signal amplified? Uh, one rhodopsin molecule can activate 500 transducin molecules or G proteins. So this is one level of, of uh, amplification. Uh, there is a ratio of one to one between transducin to phosphodiesterase because there has to be physical interaction between mole one molecule of G protein with one molecule of phosphodiesterase. But the phosphodiesterase once activated, it can convert almost 1,000 cyclic GMP molecules into GMP molecules. So you can multiply 500 by 1,000. So we're talking about 500,000 uh, molecules of cyclic GMP that are converted to uh, GMP. So this is the signal amplification, and this is an important concept. There is another level of amplification or that facilitates amplification, and that is the, the nature, the structural nature of the membrane itself. Uh, the first thing is that all of these components exist in a two-dimensional surface rather than three-dimensional surface. So that limits diffusion, that, that increases the probability that these molecules can find each other. So rather than swimming in a three-dimensional surface, these molecules, uh, they, they, can, they, can, uh, in, uh, they can move in, in two dimensions, uh, increasing the probability that they will hit each other. That's one. The other thing is that there is the structural nature of the plasma membrane of rod cells. It's really special. It, it is so viscous. It is so fluidic. It's just, it looks like uh, olive oil uh, in how viscous it is. Uh, and, and, and this viscosity allows the molecules to travel at higher speed than normal. Uh, this is a result of having low cholesterol level as well as high level of unsaturated uh, fatty acids in the membrane. So that's number two. Number three, there's cooperativity of binding. That is, when one, when one cyclic GMP is released from these gated channels, it allows, it makes it easier for a second molecule to, to be released. Uh, on the other hand, binding of cyclic GMP to the, the, the channel makes it easier for a second molecule to bind, allows the channels to open up really quick. So there's this cooperativity, same concept as hemoglobin that we talked about in basic biochemistry. So one photon can close about 200 channels, uh, uh, preventing the entry of millions of sodium ions into the cells. So again, this is a, a higher level of signal amplification. So this is how uh, the, the signal is transmitted. We'll talk about something that is really important as well, which is signal termination. This is an important concept because if the signal is not terminated, it, the signal has to be terminated and it has to be reactivated so that we can see a moving object. So for example, uh, if, if the signal is not um, is strong uh, that comes to your TV is not strong, uh, you can see an image that is interrupted or let's say that it takes time for your eye to, to, to be activated, reactivated again. So 
it, what, what, what would happen is that you'll be able to see a, a moving object, but it's, the movement is interrupted. Um, so it, the signal has to be terminated very quick, and it has to be reactivated quick as well. So let's talk about the different mechanisms of signal termination. So we'll talk about several mechanisms. Mechanism number one is a protein known as arrestin. When the rhodopsin molecule is activated, when it hits light, when light hits the molecule, uh, it gets phosphorylated by a kinase. This phosphorylation allows for a protein known as arrestin, and the name indicates what it does. So it arrests the signal. So the, the protein arrestin binds to uh, binds to the, the phosphorylated uh, molecule and, and that inactivates the rhodopsin molecule. So this is mechanism number one, the protein known as arrestin. Mechanism number two is the translocation or the change of location of two proteins, the arrestin and the transducin. In the dark, transducin, the G protein, exists uh, in, in the, in the, uh, on, on the cell membrane. On the other hand, the arrestin exists in the cell body. When the signal is activated, there is change of localization whereby the transducin molecule goes inside the cell to, again, terminate the signal, and the arrestin goes outside, increasing its presence outside so that it can bind to the uh, rhodopsin molecule and inactivate the signal. So that's mechanism number two. Mechanism number three is related to the transducin molecule itself, that is the G protein. Uh, it has an intrinsic GTPS activity. So even though it is, not, it is not an enzyme, it has the ability to convert GTP to GDP, hydrolysis of the phosphate. So when GTP is converted to GDP, the diphosphate, then the alpha subunit can bind to or associate again with the beta and gamma subunits, inactivating it. So this is an intrinsic activity of the molecule. Uh, okay, so uh, mechanism number four uh, also depends on the GTPS activity of the protein itself, of the G protein itself. Um, by uh, it, the, the GTPS activity can be activated itself by proteins known as GTPS activating proteins. So whenever the, the alpha subunit is bound to the um, to the GTP, it can bind or associate with GAP proteins, and these proteins accelerate the GTPS activity of the protein of the alpha subunit, okay. Mechanism number five is related to the release of the all trans retina. This is what we talked about before, when, when the protein uh, rhodopsin is associated with the 11 cis retinal, uh, light hits the molecule, the pigment, the visual pigment, the, the, all, the 11 cis retinal, it changes its structure, uh, the protein undergoes different transformations, eventually the all trans retinal molecule is released from the rhodopsin or the opsin molecule. Uh, this release is also another mechanism of inactivating the protein and this is something intrinsic as well. Okay, next please, mechanism number six. Uh, basically, it's related to the concentration of calcium. As I said, the main, con the main uh, function of these uh, gated channels is to allow or prevent, when they're closed, prevent sodium ions from getting into the cell. So along with the inhibition of or the blockage of uh, entry of sodium ions into the cells, calcium ions also do not enter. But at the same time, calcium ions can be uh, exported outside of the cell via other molecules or via other channels. So that causes a decrease in the concentration or the level of calcium ions inside the cells. So when ion channels close, uh, there is reduction in the concentration of calcium ions from 500 nanomolar to 50 nanomolar. This has an important uh, implication because what happens is that there, this uh, enzyme guanylate cyclase, which converts GTP to cyclic GMP, is activated when there is reduction in the concentration of calcium ions. And that causes an increase in the concentration of, cy of cyclic GMP. Cyclic GMP can then bind to the channels and the channels open up again, allowing for sodium ions and calcium ions to get into the cells. So that's an important mechanism. 
So guanylate cyclase is, again, it's a membrane-associated uh, protein. Uh, it's regulated by a protein known as GCAP or guanylate cyclase activating protein. And this protein, uh, its activity is dependent on the uh, amount of, of calcium. So what happens is that when there is a decrease in intracellular calcium, what happens is that uh, it allows the, 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 the protein, the guanylate cyclase activating protein, to, uh, two proteins to associate with, with each other, activating the guanylate cyclase itself. Okay, so that's almost like a feedback mechanism to uh, to accelerate um, uh, termination of the signal. I want you to notice something right here. So we're talking about a change from 500 nanometer to 50 nanometer, and this is the activity of the guanylate cyclase. Note how this little change in the concentration of calcium ions causes dramatic. It has a dramatic effect on the activity of the guanylate cyclase. Okay. Next, please. We have another protein known as calcium calmodulin protein. This protein uh, is dependent on the presence of calcium. It, it, it keeps the, when, when calcium levels are high, uh, it, the, the, the protein is associated with the channels, keeping them closed. So it's almost, what it does is that it, it balances the amount of sodium ions and calcium ions that get into the cell. Um, when the level of calcium, concentration of calcium inside the cell goes down, uh, the protein becomes calcium free, and that causes the dissociation of calmodulin from the channels, and the channels uh, open up again, allowing for the ions to get into the cell. Again, uh, these mechanisms all uh, work t t all together in harmony to control uh, the signal to um, uh, terminate the signal very quickly so that it can be reactivated. Let's talk about the other types of cells, uh, the cone cells. These are the cells that are responsible for, uh, uh, for vision in the light. Next, please. Now, there are three types of cells. We have cells responsible for, uh, for absorbing light in the blue wavelength others for the green, and a third for the red wavelength. There are differences between the cone, uh, between these, uh, between cone cells and rod cells, and we'll talk about this. Now, it's either that the rod cells are active or the cone cells are active. So when you go from a, a, a room that has light into a dark room, there is this transition that uh, for a few seconds that then allows you to see in the dark. This is a result of shutting down the signal in the cone cells and activating the signal in the rod cells. And that's why there is this transition period right here. Now I want you to notice something. Uh, please notice that the red and the green pigments are very close to each other and this has really important implications as well when it comes to color blindness. So next please. Um, what allows the protein to absorb light is not really the pigment itself. It's not the 11 cis retinal, rather it is the protein that surrounds or the amino acids that surround this pigment. So, uh, for example, it's, uh, this just shows the homology, the similarity in the amino acid sequence between the different, uh, different uh, absorbing proteins. So, um, What's, what's in white is basically the shared amino acids between rhodopsin and the uh, protein that is responsible for absorbing the blue, uh, blue light or blue wavelength. Uh, what's uh, in green is what's unique about uh, the, the protein responsible for visualizing green colors. And again, notice that the, uh, the, the red, uh, I mean, the amino acids in red are the ones that are specific for the protein responsible for absorbing light in the uh, red wavelength. Now, notice something that if you compare green, the green protein to the red protein, there is, they share a lot of amino acids and there's a really uh, strong homology or high homology between these proteins and this has really important genetic uh, implications. Next, please. There are three amino acids that are important for differentiating green and red uh, proteins, uh, and these are located. Uh, these are the serine or alanine in the red, 
tyrosine and threonine. On the other hand, the protein responsible for, for uh, absorbing light in the green wavelength in the same, at the same sites, we have alanine, phenylalanine, and another alanine. Now, notice that these amino acids, mainly serine and threonine and tyrosine, they have hydroxyl groups. On the other hand, these proteins are, these amino acids are aliphatic, nonpolar amino acids. So, if a mutation takes place whereby one of these amino acids changes from serine to alanine, for example, that affects the ability of the protein to absorb light uh, in the red wavelength, and vice versa. Next, please. Now, there are differences between rod cells and cone cells, uh, and pay attention to, to these in terms of light absorption, in terms of uh, the light that is absorbed, that is the wavelength that is absorbed, in terms of number, we talked about that, in terms of structure, we also talked about that, in, in terms of the, of the photoreceptor, they all have the same pigment, but the proteins are different uh, in terms of sequence, although they have similar structure, they're all seven transmembrane domain proteins, uh, the chromophores, that is the pigment itself, we talked about that, they're, they're the same. Now, but there are differences in terms of sharpness and sensitivity, and that's what's really important. So, in the light, you can see things really clear, and, and the images are very sharp. On the other hand, in the dark, uh, the image that you see is sort of fuzzy. It's not as clear as, uh, as when you see in the dark. And, and the reason behind that, uh, but, 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 but your ability to see is very sensitive in the dark versus in light. And the reason behind that is because how the cells, the rod cells and cone cells are connected to neurons. So each one of these cone cells, whether we're talking about the blue, green, or red cells, each one of them is connected to a neuron. So the signal that gets into that is transmitted to the brain is very strong. And when the brain gets that signal, it knows where that signal is coming from. And that's why when it forms an image, it forms a very sharp image. Okay. On the other hand, now the, the cone cells, on the other hand, multiple of these cone cells are connected to, uh, to uh, or multiple cone cells are connected to a, a one neuron. So the signal is really strong because it's coming from different sources. And, and that's why rod cells are very sensitive to light. On the other hand, the image is not, is not uh, a, a sharp because when the signal gets into the brain, the brain doesn't know exactly where the signal is coming from, from which rod cell, but it, it, it knows that it's coming from a certain region. So it forms an image, but this image is really fuzzy as a result of that. Next, please. Okay, so pay attention to the differences between rod and cone cells. So let's talk about color blindness. Um, now, the, the blue opsin gene is located on, on chromosome 7. On the other hand, the red and green opsin genes are located on, on the X chromosome. Now, uh, again, this all has genetic implications. And there are multiple copies of these genes as well. Now, remember, I said before that there are uh, the homology between the green opsin and the red opsin proteins are, uh, the homology is very similar. So this allows for, uh, for the occurrence of genetic recombination at higher rate. And since they are both located on the X chromosome, if you have uh, during uh, lining up, during uh, cell division, lining up of, of the chromosomes on top of each other, you have genetic recombination, exchange of genetic material. This can cause and remember that we can have multiple multiple genes of these opsin proteins on the same chromosome. This can cause uh, the loss of a gene or addition of a gene. So you can have, for example, uh, normally we should have one one red opsin, one green opsin on each chromosome. But that can, as a result of genetic recombination, we can have uh, loss of the green opsin or addition of a green opsin. Now, having two green opsin genes does not make you look or see green very well. You can have genetic recombination uh, that results in loss of a gene or addition of a gene. Having uh, an additional uh, G opsin or uh, green opsin protein does not make you see green better. 
Recombination can also occur within the genes themselves since they have high homology, resulting in a hybrid gene that has uh, some green, some uh, red. And depending on the, where the recombination takes place, you can have loss of the, the whole uh, red or the whole green gene altogether. So you can have different, so having a person with normal vision may have one green option, one red option genes, or multiple of any one of them. Uh, on the other hand, you can have loss of uh, green or altogether green option or red option genes, and that causes severe color blindness because this person would not be able to see green or or uh, or red colors. Uh, you can have a moderate severity or can have mild severity, depending again on. The, uh, the degree of genetic recombination and the loss of that gene. Now you can have differences among individuals in seeing color depending on polymorphisms uh, within the genes themselves. We talked about these three amino acids that, that are important. The tyrosine, the, uh, the uh, uh, serine, and the threonine that can be uh, changed that are different in the green option between red and the green option. Individual differences in, in ability of seeing colors uh, depending on the uh, different types of um, recombinations and the polymorphisms as well. So now, we talked about this in the genetics course, the pedigree, please go back to your notes. Uh, notice that we're talking, we're talking about in terms of red and green color blindness, we're talking about a genetic disease that is uh, dependent on uh, the X chromosome, since both are located on that chromosome, notice that how it is transmitted from males to females. Go back to your notes on genetics. I can get you in the exam a pedigree and I can tell you which, or I can give you several pedigrees and I can ask you which one of them represents color blindness for red and green. This is a sort of like representation of how a colorblind person um, would see uh, different colors.